Hello and welcome to topic three, lecture one, where we're going to talk about how crime is defined. Okay, so there are several topics that are covered in the chapter you're going to be reading this week. Um, and some of it we're going to cover in lecture and others I will just rely on you to read it in your textbook. And so um, in this lecture, we're going to talk about how crime is defined and we're going to cover the different categories of crime, the way that crime is categorized. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about the three main tools used to measure crime in the United States. Um, I will leave it to you, though, to read about trends in crimes and crime patterns in the textbook. We're not going to get to those in lecture. So let's get to uh, lecture one here, where we're going to be talking about these two top um, items. So let's get started. So when we're talking about how is crime defined, um, it, it seems like it would be pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, that a crime is a behavior that's prohibited because it causes great harm to a society. So you're just thinking you live in a society um, and you know people, members of that community don't want to be subject to harm. And so that as a community, we would come together, whether that's a city or a state or a nation, and we'd say, you know, we don't want people to be harmed, so let's make it prohibit you know certain harmful behaviors and in prohibiting them we're basically saying they're they're a crime and if you engage in there's these prohibited behaviors there's going to be a consequence for those actions a legal consequence for those actions um but it's not quite that simple because um you know when we think about actions um we can see that some actions are sort of like low harm actions but they're considered crimes but that there are other high harm actions that are not considered a crime. Um, so why is it that some low harm acts are considered crimes and why some higher harm acts are not considered crimes? Here are some examples of low or no harm behaviors that are, uh, uh, that are oftentimes uh, criminalized. Uh, and these low or no harm behaviors are oftentimes referred to as like victimless crimes, that there's no victim here. Like nobody, there's no victim. Nobody is taking advantage of, no one is being hurt by these actions. So, you know, some people would say that either, um, you know, things like prostitution or assisted suicide or gambling, um, there's not a lot of harm uh, related to those behaviors. There might be some, but is it, you know, harmful enough to actually criminalize? With prostitution, you could say, hey, you know, it's a service that's being provided, somebody who's good at giving sex and somebody who needs sex. Or you could say assisted suicide, where's, where's the harm in that? Somebody wants to end their life, but because of a debilitating condition might not be able to do that. So they get some assistance with that. Where's the victim there? Uh, you could also say gambling, you know, where's the victim in gambling, right? Uh, you have money, you want to spend it. We make choices about how we want to spend our money. And if gambling is sanctioned by the state, then you can, you know, re generate revenue from that. Um, but, you know, all, uh, 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 at least prostitution and assisted suicide are considered crimes in many states, including Wisconsin. Uh, gambling is not, um, but it, it, it's sanctioned in terms of it's our, our relationship to the, um, uh, the Native Americans within Wisconsin. Um, in other capacities, um, gambling is considered a crime. Now, on the flip, flip side of that, there's high harm behaviors um, that produce a lot of harm in society, but are absolutely legal, that they're not considered crimes. Uh, you know, uh, that, you know, could take two examples there. Uh, one might be carbon emissions, right? That we, um, you know, allow cars that uh, admit high levels of carbon, um, that we don't put limitations on how much we use our cars, that we can have manufacturing practices that result in a lot of carbon, carbon emissions, um, and that, you know, what could be more harm, harmful than that in, in terms of the impact that carbon emissions have on uh, the global warming of the, uh, or the, the warming of the, of the globe. Uh, so very harmful, but there are no laws prohibiting carbon emissions. Uh, you know, you could use the example of the economic collapse of 2008, where that economic collapse in 2008 was brought about by um, the, uh, uh, certain mortgage selling practices. If you've ever watched the movie The Big Short, you get a good idea of what those practices were. The bit, but basically, people were making money off of selling mortgages that didn't have any value. And then when it came 
uh, evident that these mortgages had no value and they lost all of their you know value on the stock market it really brought our our not just our economy but the world world economy to its knees um but those uh, mortgage selling practices were legal and many of them remain legal today even though they result in great harm okay so and what initially seems sort of simple crimes are harmful behaviors when you look at it in a little bit more more detail it's actually not as straightforward as it seems so the textbook offers three different theories of why behavior is classified as a crime um, the three theories are the consensus theory the conflict theory and the interactionist theory and so we'll look at each of these theories and in looking at these theories it could help us understand why sometimes harmful behavior is not considered a crime and why sometimes low or no harm behavior is considered a crime and i just wanted you to keep in mind that the criminalization of behavior or the criminalization of particular actions is a product of government and politics um that what is or is not defined as a crime is is a product of the actions that state and federal federal legislatures the lawmaking branches take and so if a state legislature says that it's a crime then it it's a state statute it's a criminal statute the congress says this behavior is a crime then it becomes a crime it's a reflection of the people who uh, serve in our state legislatures if they don't think it's a crime then it's not going to be categorized as a crime and so criminal law is a product of the actions of government actors uh, but criminal law is also a reflection of 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 politics um, and, and, you know, so, you know, government is sort of the institutions that govern over our, you know, your city or your state or your, or, or your nation. Uh, politics is a struggle for power, right? I mean, that you're trying to, you know, um, you, you know, that you, you get enough power so that you can, um, that your points of view can, um, persuade people to support certain candidates or certain policies. Um, but there's other kinds of power in politics as well. The more money you have, the more likely you are to be successful in a campaign, et cetera. So keep in mind that criminalization of behaviors is, is, is a, a can be a product of politics. Um, so who gets elected? Um, which party has power in the state legislature, et cetera. All of those impact the kinds of laws that are passed as it relates to criminalization of behaviors. All right, so let's dig in and take a look at these three theories that your textbook um, lays out. Okay, so let's start with the consensus view. Um, and as the name suggests, um, the idea is, is that a crime is defined uh, because it's a reflection of what the majority of the people in that society view as harmful. So from this perspective, criminal law is rules set by state authorities, as I was talking about on the last slide, that express the norms, values, and goals of the vast majority of people in that society, the consensus. So criminal law is, is social control. It's controlling those behaviors that are likely to harm society. And if the behaviors are widely accepted as harmful, they're going to be criminal criminalized. Okay. And so from this view, it's just sort of like whatever the majority, uh, you know, the vast majority of people think is harmful. That's what is going to be defined as those are the behaviors that are going to be defined as crimes for some, you know, uh, you know, crimes, it's just like abundantly apparent why, um, the, um, you know, why the vast majority of people would think murdering somebody, uh, assaulting somebody, uh, uh, forcibly taking somebody's, you know, uh, personal items, uh, whether through threats or with the forcible through an arm robbery, forcible rape, there's going to be no question that the vast majority of people in a society are going to think that those are harmful behaviors. Um, but, um, you know, that even if a behavior is not regarded as overtly harmful, the majority could feel that that behavior causes a type of harm that justifies criminalization. And uh, I think prostitution is, is a good example of that. You know, some would say, hey, prostitution, it's a victimless crime. What's the harm, right? It, it's sort of an exchange, like any, like getting your hair cut or getting a good massage, right? You know, purchasing sex, like where's the harm? Uh, but, you know, the vast majority of people in the United States, I mean, prostitution in the United States is 
criminalized in every single state except for Nevada, and that's only in certain um, counties. And even though there is a movement in the United States to um, stop thinking about prostitution as crime and thinking about it as work, like sex work, uh, those you know uh, provisions and, and endeavors aren't getting a lot of traction in the United States. Maybe they will in the future. And that's because I think it reflects the majority or the consensus point of view that, um, that prostitution is immoral, um, that there's some Something about selling sex that is wrong um, and should be prohibited. So even though it's not like physically harmful, it could be like a harm to the morality of people that live in our society. I'm not saying I necessarily agree or disagree with that, but that it's a different way of thinking about harm, the harm to our values. Uh, it could also be harmful, like it could be seen as predatory in terms of sex trafficking. And oftentimes prostitution kind of gets lumped together with the trafficking of people for sexual activities. They're actually quite distinct. Sex trafficking is distinct from prostitution, but I think prostitution is sort of th thought about as a predatory action that people with power or um, control over other people sort of like, um, you know, prey upon the weak and put them into service in terms of prostitution. Uh, and so, you know, that is from the consensus view, it helps us understand uh, how uh, prostitution is in fact harmful, even though it may not be physically harmful. All right, let's take a look at the second theory, which is the conflict view. Now, the conflict view takes a very different uh, approach to understanding how behaviors are defined as crime. The consensus view is basically saying, hey, um, uh, what is considered a crime is a reflection of the majority of the people within the society. The conflict view says that, no, that's not the case. The criminal law is a reflection of class structure. And from their perspective, they say, it's those who have economic power, the rich and powerful, they're the ones who make the laws, including the laws that criminalize behavior. And so the laws that the economically powerful make criminalize those behaviors that jeopardize their economic hold on power. And on the flip side of that, that they are not going to criminalize behaviors that reinforce or increase the economic power of those people, okay? And so for them, uh, uh, when it comes to classifying behaviors as crime, it all revolves around uh, economic power and making sure that those who have economic power stay in power. So let's look at some concrete examples from their perspective, from the conflict view perspective. Uh, and I'll just put uh, all of these up here at the same time. And we'll start with the war on drugs first. Um, from this perspective, the, the conflict view says that criminalizing drugs and, and in fact having a nationwide endeavor to basically have a, a, a war on drugs, um, that that is more a reflection of what those in economic power desire. And what so what's the thinking behind this? Um, well, for one, they say that um, you, you want to have a war on drugs and uh, that because you need a working class and that the working class needs to be sober and productive. And that if you uh, if people have access to drugs, they're going to maybe come to work compromised or they may just not be as productive as they otherwise might be. And so from this perspective, they're like, well, you got to criminalize drugs because we got to make sure that we have this working class that's working hard and long hours for uh, you know the owner class that's um, you know basically sort of like um, making profit off of the backs of the working class okay so that's one way of thinking about the war on drugs another way of looking at the war on drugs is to um, you know say look uh, there are harmful substances within our society and that uh, that those who have economic power are though are, that they produce harmful substances that, that are, are, are legal, right? Alcohol and tobacco, very harmful. People have made tons of money off of the production of alcohol and tobacco. And so that those who have economic power are not ever going to criminalize alcohol and tobacco because those with economic power benefit from keeping those drugs legal, even though they are very harmful. And in fact, in some levels, probably more harmful than so-called, you know, 
about the drugs that are uh, illegal. On the flip side of that, that um, you know that those who have economic power may not want to open up the you know allow people to sell marijuana or sell other sorts of drugs legally because it might um, you know sort of uh, 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 curtail on uh, the demand for alcohol and tobacco. And so those with uh, less economic power tend to benefit from selling marijuana. And so that you want to keep those people poor, you want to criminalize the selling of marijuana because it reinforces the power position of those who already have economic power. It's sort of their approach to understanding the war on drugs. Um, another example is the theft of uh, private property versus public revenue, theft of public revenue. Uh, you know, and so, I mean, you know, from this perspective, it's like when, you know, when people rob other people of their private property, we really crack down hard on that, right? It's like, that's super harmful, right? And it is, I'm not going to argue, of course, nobody wants to be robbed or no, nobody wants to be burglarized, right? It is harmful. However, isn't it just as harmful, and this is from the conflict of use perspective, isn't it just is harmful when people use tax loopholes um, uh, for getting around paying their fair share of taxes, whether that's, you know, this intricate tax law that's easy to get around or laws that allow corporations and rich people to put their their wealth offshore and not have to pay taxes on it. Um, isn't that also a form of theft, right? It is basically depriving the public from revenue resources that they could use for universal health care or, you know, for universal pre-K or for paid, you know, sick leave or paid um, parental leave, right? Um, and, and, or family leave. And so you could say, yeah, no doubt that, that, that stealing people's private property is wrong but why don't we make it more hard for rich people to steal public revenue right i mean that crack down on that so they would say that that's a reflection of economic power that those in economic power benefit from those tax loopholes um and that they want to make sure that that, that kind of behavior is never criminalized uh, and then again you know the harmful mortgage practices um are illegal continue to be legal um and so uh, and, and i've already talked about you know that the, the, the complete harmful effect that that had not just on our economy, but on people who were preyed upon by mortgage companies that sold them these mortgages that were very costly and led to the loss of their homes and that ultimately led to an economic collapse, okay? Why were those al allowed? Why were those harmful mortgage practices allowed? From this perspective, it was because the rich could get richer off of it, okay? So that's a another way of thinking about how crime can be defined. Okay, so let's look at the third um, viewpoint uh, or theory of how crime is defined, which is the interactionist view. Um, from this viewpoint, uh, they think that cr they assert that criminal law is a reflection of the values, opinions, and preferences of those in power. So, unlike the consensus view, that's basically saying it's what the majority of uh, it's the what the majority of the people in society think is harmful. That's what a crime. Or the um, the uh, conflict view, that's basically saying crime is a reflection of what those with economic power feel should be criminalized. From this viewpoint, they're saying that it's those, the values and opinions of those who are in power, it's those values, those moral values that are reflected in criminal law. And in other words, that it's those in power that they impose their own moral code on the rest of the population, right? Whether or not that moral code is a reflection of the consensus or not, it's just that those in power have a moral code and they impose that on society. And the way that they impose that on the society is through criminal law criminalizing certain behaviors. Uh, and so your textbook talks about this concept of the moral entrepreneur. Uh, that is that the, that groups that persuade society to enforce rules that are consistent with their own moral beliefs. And lawmakers are a group that if they have a, a consistent set of moral views or the majority of lawmakers have that, that, that base of moral values and beliefs, they use those moral values and beliefs to impose it on the rest of society. Uh, so criminal law is a reflection of the morals of those in power, not those things that are inherently evil or harmful. And, you know, we can just, uh, you know, kind of go with the, the examples that we've used up to this point uh, that, you know, and kind of uh, look at them through the inter 
actionist um, lens. Assisted uh, suicide, right? If those who are in power think that killing yourself is immoral, that you should, you know, let God's will will be done, that you shouldn't interfere with God's will, and that you should, you know, die on God's timetable, not on your own timetable. If they think suicide is wrong, then it's likely that assisted suicide would also be reflected in the criminal law because that moral value is is the one that suicide being wrong is one that's going to be held by those in power. Same with prostitution versus sex worker, right? Uh, that if those in power think that the moral value is, is that sex work is just like any other work, then that's going to be reflected in criminal law. But as we know, that's not the case in the United States. Prostitution, selling sex is seen as immoral, and therefore that's what gets reflected. Thus, crim prostitution being um, being uh, uh, criminalized. And then there at the bottom, spliffs or doobies or smoking pot or whatever you want to call it versus martinis, right? Drinking a martini, that's, you know, seen as morally okay, right? As long as you don't have, you know, 50 of them or whatever, just joking. Um, but smoking a doobie, right? That's something's wrong there. That's immoral behavior. That's wrong behavior. And so again, that's why marijuana would be illegal and alcohol legal, right? Although we saw during the time of prohibition that those in power viewed alcohol as immoral, therefore it was criminalized. And, and, and I think we're seeing a change in terms of attitudes regarding the use of marijuana. Several states are, um, you know, more than several states are legalizing marijuana. And I think that's a reflection of those in power and their attitudes towards um, marijuana, that it's not seen as really an Im immoral act anymore. Um, so those are the three viewpoints that your textbook offers that help us understand in a little bit more detail how crime is defined. Okay, so of the three of those uh, viewpoints that we just learned about, uh, which do, view do you think does the best job of explaining how behaviors get defined as criminal in the United States? Uh, do you think it's the consensus view, the idea that it's um, what is considered criminal is um, a reflection of what the majority of people want? Do you think it comes closer to the interactionist view that what is viewed as criminal is a reflection of just those who have the moral views of those in power? Um, or do you think that, um, that, that the economic power, those who have economic power, that they're the ones who have the greatest say in determining uh, what uh, behaviors are defined as crimes. So just something to think about. All right, let's move on now to talk briefly about the different categories of crime. So your textbook talks about four categories of crime, violent crime, property crime, public order crime, and economic crime. And then it talks about the way that the FBI through the Uniform Crime Reports um, categorizes crimes. And in that it's called the FBI Part 1 Crimes. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different crimes that take place in the world, in the country, in the, you know, in, in a state. Um, and so since there are a lot of different crimes, it helps us to sort of place these different crimes in categories because it allows us to, um, when you place things in categories, it allows us to um, sort of talk about crimes in a way that's sort of a shorthand. So you could say, hey, we have a decrease in violent crimes, but we have an increase in property crimes, and we kind of know what the, that means. Uh, and, and also it just helps us understand that we have a lot of crimes, but that, that crimes are categorized in a different way. And certain crimes get more attention from the criminal justice system, violent crimes, usually considered felonies. Uh, but other crimes, such as property crimes, some property crimes, public order crimes, are oftentimes seen as lesser offenses and would fall into the misdemeanor category, okay? Um, so it's important to learn about these different categories because it helps us think about how we measure crime. Okay, so let's look at the category of violent crimes. Um, that Uniform Crime Report, which we're gonna be learning more about in the next lecture, it identifies four offenses as making up the violent crimes in the United States. And so um, violent crimes are murder and non-negligent manslaughter, also known as voluntary manslaughter. It's sort of like you intended to kill somebody. A forcible rape, that is when you sexually assault somebody using some sort of force, whether that's bodily force or some sort of weapon. 
a robbery, again, taking um, somebody's property by force. Again, it could be by your own bodily force or with a weapon and some sort of aggravated assault, which usually means some sort of intrusion into your body or your person um, in, in terms of the assault, not like a verbal assault. Uh, and so those are going to be considered uh, violent crimes. And you'll see when we look at the Uniform Crime Report and you learn about it in, in your textbook, um, that, that that's one category of crime that the UCR measures. Uh, your textbook talks about the difference between expressive violent crimes and instrumental violent crimes. Um, a lot of times we think about um, violent crimes as maybe being a, an expression of rage, right? You kill somebody because you're really mad at them. Um, you're, you, you rape somebody because uh, it's, an, it's, it's a demonstration of power over another person. Uh, and so it's sort of like uh, that it, it's a, a violent crime that's coming out of rage. Um, but violent crime can also be instrumental. Uh, that means that you engage in a violent crime for social or economic advancement. And so let's say you might be a member of a gang and part of the gang, like, you know, uh, sort of uh, initiation is that you demonstrate that you can kill somebody, right? Or, or, or um, you know, arm rob somebody, right? Or, you know, heaven forbid, even, you know, forcibly rape somebody. Uh, and so that's inter instrumental because if you've got a social advancement from that, you get entry into, into a gang. Um, but, you know, you could also be economic uh, uh, advantage as well. Rob somebody because you need their money, um, that you could kill somebody because you're a murderer for hire, right? So make sure you read about the difference between expressive violent crimes and instrumental cri violent crimes in your textbook. Uh, property crimes uh, are um, de defined by the UCR as crimes against property for the most part. And so burglary, burglary is entering into somebody's house without, a, without uh, approval and stealing their things. A larceny theft is, you know, not entering into somebody's home or, uh, you know, uh, some sort of infrastructure that you're not supposed to be in and taking things, uh, but it could be stealing things from a store or, uh, you know, uh, you know, you find a, a wallet sitting on a table and you, and you, and you steal it. That would be theft. Uh, motor vehicle theft, uh, arson, all of those fall in the category of what is known as property crimes. And the UCR measures property crime as well. We have a lot more property crime in the United States than violent crime. All right, public order crimes. Uh, public order crimes are the kinds of crimes that are reflective of behaviors that are illegal because they are seen as running against morality. Uh, so it relates to uh, what we were um, uh, talking about when it came to the interactionist viewpoint in defining crimes. So prostitution, public order crime, public intoxication, uh, gambling could be a public order crime, lewd conduct, you know, um, sitting on the, the street corner without your pants on or something like that, right? Those are all going to fall in the, the category of public order crimes, usually misdemeanors. Uh, and economic crimes, again, can be uh, somewhat harmful or, you know, greatly harmful to society, depending on the act. Uh, but economic crimes are, you know, crimes having to do with the economy. And so they're nonviolent acts. Uh, they're principally motivated by uh, economic gain, not that violent crimes can't also be motivated by economic gains, uh, but that these are those that are primary or their principal motive is, is economic uh, gain. And, and so a tax evasion, violating, not, not paying your taxes, insider trading, um, uh, that uh, using the mails to defraud people of their money, uh, cyber crimes, stealing people's identity, all of those are revolve around, um, you know, uh, uh, behaviors that are uh, motivated for economic gain. And then the first, uh, the final category we'll talk about is that, that what's known as um, FBI part one crime. So again, this is just sort of descriptive, but you should be aware of what these are. The, um, the, the FBI, uh, you know, through the uniform crime report, they're responsible for the uniform crime report uh, that the FBI oftentimes in the uniform crime report oftentimes refers to as part one crimes. Okay. And so those are seen as like sort of the more serious crimes and it gives us a, a like a better sense of the um, the amount of crime that we have in the United States. And so part one crimes are uh, the 
uh, included in part one, one crimes are both violent crimes and property crimes. So violent crimes such as murder, non-negligent manslaughter, forcible rape, robbery, and aggravated assault are part one crimes, but so is burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and arson. Those are also included in part one crimes, serious crimes. Uh, and so you'll see that that often referred to in our readings and in the textbook as it, it makes reference to this this categorization from the UCR FBI part one crimes. Okay, that's it for this lecture. The next lecture is going to take a look at the tools we use to measure crime. Thanks for paying attention. Talk to you again soon.